Welcome again, saints. Let me pray for us. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we just thank you, Lord, uh, for just gathering us again, once again, to, Lord, have a study time with your word, Lord, to, Lord, just meditate on your word, to see what's in your word, Lord, to push bass back and past, Lord, uh, uh, horizontal limits, Lord, that are people that have tried to put on us, Lord, to see you, Lord, to understand the deeper mysteries of God. Father, we just thank you, Lord, and, and just praise you for always keeping us. Lord, open our eyes and ears. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, saints, today is Lesson 7, July 17, 2022. We're still in Unit 2, the Word, the agent of creation bringing the light. And before I say that, I want y'all just to subscribe here. If you have not subscribed to this channel, be a part of our growing community here on YouTube for the St. Mark Baptist Church in Waterloo, Iowa, and their dearest, dearest servant, uh, Brother Dell. So once you go down and hit the subscribe button. And again, we are in unit uh, to the word, the agent of creation, bringing the light. Devotional reading is John 5, 31 through 40. Background scripture, John 12, 27. Ooh, we got a little bit to cover today. 27 through 50. Print passage, John 12, 44 through 50. Whew. <laughs> Cut that down. I, have, I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth in me shall not abide in darkness and before we get to the lesson names, just going back one today, because uh, I want this to be a super kind of short, impactful lesson today. And last week, July 10th, was never too far away. And we, we, we zeroed in on a lesson name and a couple of what do you think. But first, trust Jesus by lesson name, trust Jesus by faith and action to do what we cannot do. And to do what we cannot do, saints, is, is just like really, it, it's, that is what our relationship with Jesus is based on, right? The Bible said it's by grace through faith that you are saved. It is a free gift of God, not, not of works, lest any should boast. The Bible says there's no other name other heaven whereby we must be saved. And that's including your, your name. That's including our mom's name, pastor name, whoever that is. So we're trusting Jesus to by faith to do what we cannot do. But here is where kind of we get into trouble. When we're talking about never too far away. Uh, they, it was it was interesting because when I was a kid in the choir, uh, we uh, sung that song that the adults sang, Jesus on the main line, tell him what you want, oh, Jesus on, you know, we sung that song. And, and and it's literally true, right? As you get older, these old things that the old church did uh, back in the, when I was a kid in the 80s growing up, graduate high school in the early 1990s, you find out right, that uh, what they were saying was like certainly true. So he's never far away. He's just a call away by your mouth and spirit, a moan, whatever it is. And we are trusting him to do what we cannot do. And I would even boil that down even to a micro level or, or a tiny level, a microscopic level, if you will, to saying he can even give us uh, the strength just to call on his name. Because if you think about it, it takes faith to call on his name. But a lot of times we get so bogged down, so ashamed of something we've done that we run away and we we believe, oh, I'm going to get myself back together and go back. And that time never comes because we do not believe that we have the strength. Well, in ourselves, we do not. Because remember, one of Paul's strategic imperatives when uh, he said, uh, he had a thorn in the flesh, Paul said three times. He said he prayed, got him removed the flesh, thorn, and he said, my grace is sufficient for you. And Paul went on to say, I therefore more boast in my weaknesses than my strengths, because when I am weak, he is strong, right? So it is God who makes up the gap. He makes up the gap. When you are weak, all it takes is admitting you are weak and you may not even have the strength to do it. But again, as our uh, lesson name says, he can do what we cannot do, what that old uh, uh, Baptist uh, missionary Baptist song say, he can do what no other power, Holy Ghost power can do. You remember that song? And that is certainly true as well. But we push through as well to get to one of the what do you thinks. And it's why do we why do desperate situation often causes lapses, lapses in faith? And, and next it says, do believers today require signs and wonders to acknowledge Jesus power? The answer on both of those. Well, first is yes. Desperate situation often uh, they often cause lapses of faith uh, simply because, again, things don't go the way that we think they should go. So we lose faith because deep inside of us, uh, we say his thoughts are not our thoughts, neither his ways, our ways. That's what we say with our mouth. 
But if, if things don't go our way, our faith lapses because we can see in our minds how things should go. And then God is on that level where his thoughts are not our thoughts. Uh, and so his ways are higher than our ways, the scripture. We lose faith because we think we know what's best. And that's what it boils down to. Losing faith, oftentimes, even if you go back to sins, believing you know what's best. And we do not know what is best uh, for us. And those lapses in faith... We don't think about this, but those lapses in faith often cause collateral damage. And what I mean by that is it is interesting that in the Old Testament, uh, if, if, if Israel, or certainly children of Israel, when God first got them out of Egypt, if they did something, God would literally curse their families into the third and fourth generation, right? And he would, and, and they would be punished. And that's where this thing comes from about the sins of a father, go to the son and to the grandson and those type of things. But at the same time, we think that we should know. And when we get to those places, we should just call on the name of Jesus. Second part is, do believers today require signs and wonders to acknowledge Jesus' power? Yes. I mean, there are denominations within the, the within uh, the, the fellowship of Jesus. You know, I, I hesitate to use the word Christian because that can mean a lot of things. Right. We had Christians in front of the Supreme Court protesting uh, for the right uh, to not honor the lives of the defenseless. And I'll leave it there. However, what I do know is we have whole, whole, these whole denominations saying if there's not, if I come, for instance, I come up out of the water, then, well, something is wrong with me. We also have others who, who say, oh, you need to come to this healing service. All of this stuff which is like putting the whole, trying to put the Holy Spirit in a headlock saying you should show up between 6.15 and 8.30 for our church service next week. If y'all come there, it's going to be signs and wonders. God doesn't show up like that. It just, we, re, uh, there's some that require signs and wonders. And here's what you're going to find. Most of those denominations are chock full of young adults. And it isn't because necessarily they're being fed. It's just because they're about faith and action. New age churches are about activating our faith, right? Walking it out and, and not having patience. When is the last time you heard one of the New Age pastors say, tell somebody to wait on the Lord? No, they're talking about miracles. They're talking about signs. They're talking about the gift of speaking in tongues. Tongues is a gift according to scripture. We can chop that up all you want to, but that's what it says. Gift of knowledge, gift of wisdom, gift of healing, the gift of tongues, right? So again, yes, but Jesus also said a wicked generation will seek after a sign and none will be given. Before I go today, I'm, I'm going to throw this out there to those uh, people, uh, YouTube, uh, YouTube, whatever social media platform you're finding this on, uh, Terrestrial Radio on Waterloo, Iowa, KBBG 88.1 or KBBGFM.info, streaming live around the world. Um, you have people grabbing the microphone, babbling and babbling and think they're talking in tongues and pleasing God. And what they are doing is mocking God. The Bible tells us the person that talks in tongues edify themselves so there should be a translator present so the church could be edified. So what I'm saying is these people that I'm still here, they require these signs and wonders and they will even go to a place of being deceived and mocking God in order to get there. If God, if tongues ain't on you, you need to stop babbling. God is not playing with you. The Bible says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. I'm not saying tongues is a reality because it is. And in anybody, Baptist, whoever you are, you say speaking in tongues in church and the Lord, you need, you need to sit down and read scripture and, and, and really you need to repent. Really, because that's blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Tongues are reality. But what I'm saying is you can tell tongues aren't as evident or plentiful as people in certain denominations would want you to believe. Because they're just up there babbling, talking a bunch of nonsense, mocking God. It's the truth. If you don't like it, take it to the throne of God. And if I were you, you ah, bah, 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 and doing all that nonsense that's not of the Holy Spirit and you're mocking God, if I was you. I would search my heart out right now to ask God if you've ever been one of those persons and you need to repent of that. You need to turn is what you need to do. And that is the reality. And today, lesson seven, again, uh, the agent of creation, bringing the light. I am come as light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. The lesson aims are recognize that Jesus is God. It's it's that period. We're going to talk about that. I just put a position paper together. Desire a closer relationship with God through choosing to follow Christ. 
Three, share with others the opportunity to come into the light of Christ. First, recognize that Jesus is God. Uh, why I can assure you that uh, this claim of Jesus is biblical. Again, John chapter one, you know, I cited often Sunday school students in the beginning was the word and the words with God and the word was God. Same as also in the beginning with God. Genesis one says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and darkness was on the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the waters. John chapter one, Genesis chapter one, you put those together. What it tells you is that Jesus is the word. Jesus is God. Later in John uh, chapter one, that word became flesh and dwelt among us. Not only that, in Genesis chapter one, it tells you that Jesus is the creative agent. If he is God, he was in the beginning with God. And John chapter one also said all things were made by him and for him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Jesus is sovereign. He's God in the flesh. And here is the elegant beauty of this. I want you to freeze and rewind this here because you need to hear this is the beauty, the elegance of that is only God himself was enough to rectify sin, which came from eternity. Again, Adam and Eve, this story you heard about Adam and Eve uh, committing the original sin, that is not accurate. That is misrepresenting what's in you, the biblical narrative. I'm going to tell you two sins that hurt, uh, occurred and that occurred prior to the fall. First, and I'm going somewhere with this. We got to talk about this. You need to know how to defend the faith, saint. We got to stop playing games. You need to know how to defend the, the, the faith. There was two sins committed before the fall, the, before Adam and Eve, probably millions more. But, I, but we'll talk about that. First, we have... Lucifer in Ezekiel 28, it was, uh, they were living talking about, oh, you know, uh, he walked in the garden of God. Uh, his pipes were perfectly created from the day he was made. But then we go over to Isaiah 14. Lucifer said in his heart, I will ascend to the throne of the most high. I'll be like God. I'll sit on the mountains of the north, this and that. And he was cast down. Bam. So that's the first sin. Isaiah 14. Lucifer, the perfect cherubim, throne covering cherubim from Ezekiel suddenly becomes Lucifer of Isaiah 14, who was judged for sin and he was cast down. This does not say that angels are sinners. We, we can talk about it another time. I don't want to get into that apologetics case. Nevertheless, that's the first sin that the biblical narrative records. The second sin is a lie from the serpent that convinced Adam and Eve to commit the sin, the third sin. So we got Lucifer in heaven. He committed a sin. He was cast down. We know that had to be prior because he was in heaven. We see that at least a demonic, at least the evil spirit of Satan on the serpent. We talk about that another time. Uh, Revelations identifies him as that old serpent, the devil, if not Genesis. But I'm saying he committed sin in eternity. He was cast down. We find that same demonic evil spirit anyway in the garden telling Adam and Eve, this is how that conversation went. Hath God said that she shall not eat of the tree of the God? The woman said, God has said right off the top of my spirit here, of every tree of the garden we may eat, but of the tree that's in the midst of the garden we may not eat. For the day we eat thereof, we shall surely die. And here is the second sin. He said, Jesus, not surely die, because God doesn't know. When you eat, your eyes will be open and you will be like God's. He lied. That led to the third sin of Adam and Eve. So what I'm saying today, saints, is we have to understand this, is that when we're talking about sin and recognizing Jesus and God, and we recognize all of this, we have to, we have to read his word, the study show ourselves approved, because you've been told your whole life that, they, that Adam and Eve committed the original sin. That's not true. I just told you why. Here's what's really going to mess you up. We know prophetically that there were angels that participated in the Isaiah 14 event with Lucifer. So let's just say, and I'm not, I'm just saying perhaps, let's just say there was 500 angels that went with Lucifer. That's 500 more sins that happened before Adam and Eve were ever created or be, uh, before they fell anyway. We got to get this thing right here. That is the reality. Amen. And next, desire a closer relationship with God through choosing to follow Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. Again, only only God was enough to rectify uh, that corruption of sin and creation. So he literally came down and put on flesh. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. The same God that was in the beginning and caught us. 
that were descending into hell. God had to come and catch us because universally, nothing else was. And finally, share before I go to the analysis of the biblical text, share with others the opportunity to come to the light of Christ. This is our whole reason for this is our whole reason for ministry. Ministry is not about them dead programs. It's not about those dead programs. It's everybody getting together. And, and, and a lot of times, you know, a lot of times the, the, the spirit is hiding in places. I get it. But at the same time, how often are we going out to reach the lost? And that doesn't mean just inviting people to church. That means going out to affect the gospel of Jesus Christ, to make that word live to people that are never going to come into the house of God, at least to plant the seed. You are not representing Christ to recruit members to come to one of these places. You are, you are out there preaching Jesus and, 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 and encouraging people to believe on him. That doesn't always happen in the house of God. It rarely happens in the house of God. It happens with the lost when we go out to them. This is what Jesus said. This is what he said. This is what he did. This is what his apostles did. Uh, uh, Peter, and, and he went to the lost Jews, and Paul went to the lost Jews at first, but then he's apostle to Gentiles, then he went out to a lost world. There were marketplace preachers. So saints of God, share with us the opportunity of the light to come to Christ. It, we have to go see about these people. You don't have to do like I do, or, or my brother Bria Martin does, and grab a bullhorn and go out on the street telling people about Jesus. You ain't got to do that. There's somebody more bold than that in my purview, and that's people that actually real Christians or real believers that go up and knock on doors and say, he said, Jesus Christ, your savior, door slammed, cussed out, clown. Oh, I won't talk. Man, just rejected time after time after time. Those are the bold ones in the faith. Yeah, uh, out with a bullhorn, that seems bold, but get, but one-on-one -on -one risking that sort of rejection time after time after time after time, man, that's bold. So that is how we also share with others the opportunity to come to the light of Christ. And the introduction, Miss introduction, missed opportunity. How many of us can attest to having had the experience? Often the emotional or psychological result of a missed opportunity does not become challenging to our self-esteem until we grow much older. Missed opportunities and experience in all facets of life. Man, I should have. Why didn't I follow my mind and boom, I have... If I had only waited, I could have, huh? Why didn't I allow that special person to get away? And the list goes on. The real challenges of missed opportunities is to see it as an opportunity for growth instead of a cause for regret. And man, I, I listen, saints, I can't tell you the number of men that I've met and we talk about that and talk about this. Uh, I might have on my, my Marine Corps hat, uh, yeah, something like this, the, the, these sorts of things. And they said, oh, you know, you, you, you military? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What branch are you in? I said, Marine Corps. They said, oh, you know, I almost joined. <laughs> if I had a dime for you, every time I heard you almost joined. And then there's other people that could have, would have, should have, right? And one of the greatest, and, and this is, this is, this is one of my, uh, one of my three regrets in life, because I really only got three. <laughs> Not really. Everything else, it is what it is, right? One of my great, greatest regrets in life was a man. I got out of the Marine Corps, uh, and I was like, man, I, two, a week later, I was like, man, I, I shouldn't have done that, right? But we all live with some could have, would have, should have. I am here in front of you. That's how it is. Th praise God, right, for his mercy on me. But I said that to say this is that we don't need to be a people that be that there's this would have, could have, should have. Now, also, here's where it becomes important for believers. I just talked to you about bringing the light. This is what the title of this lesson is, bringing the light, introducing people to Jesus. How many times have some you talk to somebody you urged to, you know, tell them about Jesus or, or ask them what they're doing, however it was. And they walked away because you were like embarrassed and know how they were going to take it. And you were supposed to tell them about Jesus. Nothing is a greater regret as that in your life. Now, you may have, again, could have, would have, should have. We'll talk about that real quick because we just got, oh, yeah, we just got a few verses. Could have, would have, should have. So my, you can regret not saying something. I don't have that problem. You know, I, I'm a bullhorn type of guy. I'm going to get in your face. Blah, tell you about Jesus. Hold up the cross. Yay! My problem is I go too far sometimes. <laughs> so you and I both have that could have, would have, should have because I've had situations 
Well, I know I went over the line. I mean, I, I just did. My zeal gets the better of me. I realize that, YouTube. I know it does. My dear brother, uh, Breon Martin, here in Waterloo and his uh, uh, wonderful, wonderful family, wonderful wife, uh, Pastor Chastity Martin. Brother Breon told me something. I want to share it with you. He's a hardcore street preacher, man. He made me seem like a puppy dog. I mean, he's just hardcore. He just, bam. Yeah, he's hardcore. He said, he said, Dale, he said, we're not wildfires. We're controlled burns. Again, Dale, we're not wildfires. We're controlled burns. And man, I was, I was, I about fell over when my dear brother gave me that revelation because I knew at that moment I was convicted because the thing is, I can turn into a wildfire and I'll burn everything down around me when, the, when Jesus didn't tell me to go that far. So again, that's regrets I have. My thing is this, against thee and thee only if I sin and done this evil to your sight, in your sight, Lord, this is what the Bible says. One of those things about the call that people like me have is that a lot of times our zeal will get the better of us. Just like, it's like Elijah running out to the wilderness, God said, after he killed 400 false prophets. He, it wasn't that he killed those false prophets, but then he ran away. He went too far by running away and he said, God, that's enough, kill me. You want God to kill him, pressure too much. So th that zeal can get in our way. And what it can do is it can bring about, I could have, I should have, I would have. I want to be more graceful, but I don't want to be more graceful if it costs me any boldness, I don't know where that line is. So you might be the opposite saint and you might not be bold enough. But what I'm saying is all of us should seek balance in the faith to bring people to the light of Jesus. Because if I've stumbled anybody being who I am, a little one, God, you know, God's little ones, he's, I'm going to have to answer for that. And it's not going to be pretty. So I'm saying, saints, is we should seek balance. Analysis of the biblical text, the final opportunity. Jesus, and this is John 12, 44 through 46. Jesus cried and said, he that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. I come a light unto the world that whosoever believeth in me should not abide in darkness. This is what it says. And, and the description says the nation of Israel's rejection of John's evidence verifying Jesus' true identity resulted in an event that led to his death on the cross. John explained that scriptural reason behind their rejection. The apostle says that even after all the miraculous signs they witnessed, they stubbornly persisted and they refused to believe. And you know, that goes all the way back to their forefathers in Israel. No time. They just got through the Red Sea, Exodus and Exodus 14, Exodus 15. Moses, they, just, they sing this beautiful song to God. And next thing you know, they whining because they ain't got no water. So that, that goes all the way back to their forefathers in the Bible, right? Not, not a new thing. The blatant unbelief fulfilled Isaiah's prophecy. It was disbelief by design. It was with God's will because it was within God's will and plan. The nation's rejection opened their opportunity for salvation to the Gentiles. Leadership among the Jews opting to believe did so secretly for the fear of being excommunicated from the synagogue. I, I got to go back here because uh, we need I need to I need to make sure you understand something. It, it says it was disbelief by design because it was within God's will and plan. I am assuming my dear brother is not saying God intentionally designed sin. Just anything that is not of faith is what? Sin. That's what the Bible says. The Bible further talks about tempt he no one to sin, but they sin because they are led away with their lust. So I am assuming my dear brother is not saying their disbelief or their unfaithfulness was God's design. But just because it's not his will, it doesn't mean it doesn't work within his will. The Bible talks about, for we do know that all things work together for the good of them that love God and for, to, for the good of them that are, are called according to his purpose. Abraham being called according to God's purpose, God made some promises to Abraham. Those Jews cut up hundreds, hundreds of thousands of years later, they still cutting up. And God has destroyed him because of one of his promises to his friend Abraham. God didn't design sin or disbelief. He, he couldn't have. We did that uh, when we listened to Lucifer. And I'm not saying, again, that was the original sin. But the, the nation, that, that thing about disbelief by design, I'm, I'm not really feeling that. And I'm going to email my brother 
to see what he was saying, because just because God knows somebody's going to sin, it doesn't mean that it's his plan that they do sin. And certainly he's not writing sin into the biblical narrative, because that would mean that God set us up and that we weren't designed to eternally dwell, dwell with him until we committed the third sin. That is, a well, yeah, we'll just say the third sin in the biblical record. Uh, language matters. So I'm going to find out what that's all about. John used the verb crazo to emphasize Christ's emotional intensity in uttering his last words to them. Where he spoke these words is not indicated. It appears that they were words in general, a summary of Jesus's manifestation of himself to the nation. Jesus affirmed that when one believes in him and uh, believes in him only, it is not in him only, but in the one who sent him, which was himself. <laughs> <laughs> how can that be Dale how can he be the sender and the receiver omnipresence <laughs> that's who he's talking to in the garden that's who he's talking to on the cross remember in the beginning was the word the word was with God and the word was God so it was also only beginning with God all things were created by him and for him and without him was not anything made to mistake anybody said but he was talking to, who he was talking to on the cross he was talking to himself he had to be he was omnipresent in both heaven and on earth. We see another representation of that in the book of Revelations. There was he who sat on the throne and the lamb being Jesus was standing in front of him. How can it be on the throne, stand in front of the throne? Omnipresence. <laughs> Woo -wee. In order to, <laughs> there's no separated son. Jesus himself. Who raised Jesus up out of the grave? God. But Jesus said, I lay down my life and I take it up again. How can he be dead and raise himself up unless he was, his physical body was dead in one place, but the spirit, but who he is, is present in another. That's because he is God. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> I know, forward it to your pastor. Forward it to your teacher. See what they say about it. You know how to get in touch with me. I love to hear their written positive and their written response. <laughs> what do you think? How can believers develop an intense desire to reach the lost because of the certainty of Christ's return? You could develop that intensity when you realize how serious this thing really is. This nation is under judgment right in front of your face. This isn't about gas prices. This isn't about no, uh, uh, babies being starved from milk. This is those things happen because God is judging America, taking what we desire, uh, uh, what we worship, and that's things and money, and travel, and the other things that people are in front of the the, the uh, Supreme Court right now upset because they can't serve as executioners of the most defenseless among us. So this nation is under judgment. You haven't developed an intense desire because you don't really believe that things are as bad as they are. You're looking around. You got a little money in the bank. But what are you going to do in two years when gas prices are $10 a gallon? What you going to do? I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to stay home and I'm going to tend my garden and provide for my family as well as I can and go out hunting. That's what I'm going to have to do. What are you going to do? Because someone came out of the White House and Joe Biden Two days ago, you know what he said? A black reporter asked this person that, that has white, white House access in the administration, what do you say to people who are concerned about their gas price? He said they need to get used to it because it's a new liberal order. Saints, America is under judgment. You develop intensity when you understand what's really going on. You are in these places, in these houses of worship, and being rocked to sleep like a two month old baby in the arms of its mother. How many of you are hearing that judgment is here in America? How many of you are hearing sermons and lessons on the Matthew chapter 24, Daniel chapter seven, the book of Revelations, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. How many of you are reading Zephaniah? How many of you are reading Amos? How many of you read Ezekiel? Saints, listen, how can believers develop an intense desire to reach the lost? You can develop it when you understand that plague and pestilence is in the land. You call it COVID-19, monkeypox, whatever it is, something worse is coming. It's coming. This is not a game. This is not a joke. I'm intense because I know what's coming. This is not 
a joke, saint. Get about telling people. Whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, it doesn't matter. Ah, the only escape, John 12, 47 through 50. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my worth have one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last days. For I have not spoken of myself, but of the father which sent me. He gave me a commandment that I should say and I should speak. And I know that this commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the father said unto me, so I speak. Nobody has seen God at any time. Yet Jesus said before Abraham was, I am. Seven more times in the Gospel of John, Jesus said, I am, directly connecting himself to the I am that I am. Tell them I am has sent you in Exodus, which we know to be God. Jesus, saints, is God. Because when you think about it, God required a sinless lamb in the Old Testament and animal sacrifices. He still needed a way for people to be reconciled unto him because he cannot break. He's not going to break that part of his word. He's not going to do it. So what he did is he fulfilled the law through himself by coming as the word became flesh and dwelt among us. I know it's hard to grab, but it is true. It is true. And what do you think as we close? Where is, why is there a noticeable lack of seriousness towards studying the word of God? Because you depend on people like me to tell you that. And oftentimes what happens is people that are not like me, and that really want you to outgrow the need to hear me and to hear straight from God and to go plan a ministry and start discipling people in your home because you're mature enough. Doesn't mean there doesn't need to be accountability. But when we talk about that, bringing in the light, this last, what do you think becomes uh, the no so lack of seriousness because you are dependent on people like me to do it for you. Saint Jesus said, Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be open. When Jesus died, Bible says, the earthquake, the veil of temples ripped. You can go straight to God. Yes, he gives some of us to do this. I get that. But there's a lack of seriousness because, again, when we go back to this intense desire and the other, what do you think? There's not an intense desire to be serious about God's word when we put it together because we don't believe that things are that serious and we're too dependent upon other people. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, thank you for this lesson today. Lord, as we go into, uh, Lord, the July 24th lesson, Father, I just thank you, Lord, for this. I thank you for this lesson. Father, I, I just ask that you, Lord, open your people's eyes that they will come and they will see how serious this stuff is, Lord, and that you're not playing games with any of us. Jesus, we need you. Amen. And so be it. Again, don't forget to subscribe. Go down in the, sec in, in the section of this video. And saints, I really want you to support the ministry by ordering or going to sermon downloads, which is a link in the description section as well. And I want you to download some of our, our sermons. We have small 25 packs, 50 packs, 75 packs. Uh, we have a whole year. I have a whole year worth of sermon series notes, 104, five pages of notes. We, I have 200 sermons. 600 page note, we, I, I have it, and I just want you to be blessed and support our ministry. I'm not gonna ask you to donate money. No, 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 I want to be a blessing um, to you as well, far beyond these videos. So be it. Hey, just a quick break in this video to tell you to go to sermondownloads.net. The link is in the description section of this video. Download six different sermon packages or pass these on as a gift to Bible study teachers, preachers, pastors, deacons, whoever it is. We buy books. We buy devotionals, right? We buy all of this Christian literature, Sunday school lesson books. I'm asking you to take the next step and support sermondownloads.net. They're down in the description section of this video. Click on the link. So be it.